everybody. Welcome to this week's edition of UGA Sports Live. Uh, another week without Roddy, which means another week with a lot of news, as always uh, happens. Uh, I'm joined today by Dane Young, uh, producer of the show, host extraordinaire. And uh, we got a guy, Trent Smallwood, in here because, hey, like I said, a lot of news to talk about. Most of the recruiting centered over the past week, uh, so uh, plenty to touch on. I uh, do want to give a shout out before we get started to all of our sponsors, uh, Classic City Eats, certainly. Uh, get out there, swing by, uh, give them a call. They're doing curbside pickup. If you want to do that, you can eat in the restaurant, uh, whatever you want to do. Um, they've got you set up with family meals, hot wings. Uh, they're doing brunch on Sundays. They got trays with uh, your, uh, your, your, your choice of sides. Um, basically everything you could want. Uh, they've got you hooked up when it comes to the good food. So uh, swing by and see our friends at Classic City Eats. Um, also Athens Ford, big sponsor of the show and the site. We appreciate those guys so much. You're in overhead doors, 10% off with code or uh, with uh, just a, by admitting you're a UGA fan. Nobody else on earth does that. So, Aaron Overhead Doors for all your overhead door needs. Your pie, peach and prosciutto season is back. We'll touch on that a little bit later. And yes, I can say the word prosciutto. Roddy can't. I'm taking the reins on that. That's and, big news uh, to me. I know you said like commits and transfers, but peach and prosciutto. Um, yeah, absolutely. I did not absolutely. realize. So, thank you for that. <laughs> And then uh, uh, definitely get out and see our friends at Academia Brewing. Uh, they've got plenty of seating, uh, plenty of space for you to go uh, go chill there, and um, just about everything you could want as far as great food and great beer. So uh, swing by and see those folks. Make sure to stop by and get a six pack, and also grab a uh, grab some food while you're out that way too. All right, guys. Like I said, plenty to talk about this week. Busy, busy week. Uh, last Tuesday, we had the podcast. Chaz Chambliss had just committed when we came on the air. I think it was, what was it, Tuesday night or was it Wednesday? Georgia gets another uh, commit, this time starting off the 2022 season. Marquise Groves Killebrew, uh, big pickup for him, four-star kid out of uh, Brookwood he is now. I, I've had to clarify this a couple of times because he's kind of bounced in between Brookwood and Grayson, but he's back at Brookwood now. So uh, props to them for that. JT Daniels on Thursday kind of rocks the whole world of college football. That was insane. And then old, old Scoops Roos over there figuring out ah. where uh, JT Daniels is crossing the country. <laughs> somebody, uh, somebody on the board asked, do we want to call it a Roos bomb going forward? No, I'm, I'm fine with that. We can accept that term. <laughs> um, well, maybe a little heads up on the next Roos bomb. How about yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then, uh, uh, yeah, or, uh, and then Saturday, kind of a quiet day. Not as much fanfare around it, obviously, but a huge pickup for the Bulldogs that can't be underrated, and that's Dylan Fairchild out of West Forsyth High School. Really like that pickup. Let's just go back through the week, guys. Of the three, I think Daniel's probably the most surprising of the group, so we'll start there. Uh, let's talk through that one. Uh, Dane, we'll start with you. Just your reaction when you heard the news, man. I mean, uh, that, that it looked like JT Daniels was going to uh, make his way to UGA. Uh, obviously, you caught that news first over on the dog event, but uh, let's uh, let's dive in. What were your feelings? And uh, you know, having watched some film on him now, uh, what, what are you seeing? Uh, it was stunning, first of all. I don't think many people saw that coming. I think it was uh, blindsided to a lot of Georgia fans and a lot of people that are even plugged into the program, and that's a testament to how stealth Kirby Smart and his staff are and how they just kind of explore all options. On its face, I, I think everyone was like, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense for JT Daniels, but the more that you sit there and you look at it, you say, okay, you've got Jamie Newman who, you know, by all accounts is going to be the starter for this upcoming season. And that's even before you get to the conversation of what is JT Daniels eligibility as the transfer, which is, you know, we have to see what's going to happen. With that. If he were to be eligible for the season, at worst, it's just an incredible insurance policy because maybe Carson Beck's not quite as far along as he could be for not having a spring practice. You do have Dwan Mathis coming off of a very severe injury and that recovery. By all accounts, he's fine, but you still never know. And then you've got Stetson Bennett, who's a good player, but maybe you know Georgia thinks they need a little bit more for the season. Whatever the reasoning is, it doesn't hurt to add a player with the arm strength of JT Daniels into your program. And I think that's the baseline of, of where this is. Uh, we do have uh, Brent Rollins and I have a piece coming out later this week uh, on Daniels and kind of what he did at USC. 
He is coming off an ACL injury. He had surgery last October. Uh, so there's some recovery still happening with that. Uh, you know, this gets going to be a, a bit more raw, a bit more of a project than I originally thought. If you go back and look at his tape, you see a lot of things that say this was an 18-year-old kid starting in a Power 5 conference, and that's difficult to, to manage. Arm strength is there. Uh, he's got to refine some accuracy, um, but he also is going to have a better offensive line in front of him than he did at USC. So as a whole, I think it's a bit more of a project than what maybe some fans think, but the upside is is there tremendously. Trent, uh, your feelings on the pickup. I mean, first off, just how you felt when you heard the news and then, uh, you know, your feelings on Daniel. I know we both got a chance to see him at the Rivals Five Star Challenge a couple years back. Well, I think, I mean, of course, it's a, it's a good pickup anytime you can land a transfer of that caliber. I think, uh, I mean, his arm strength, arm strength combined. Uh, one thing that, that Newman and um, Daniels and Vandergrip all have in common that, Monken, uh, that Todd Monken really likes is the, the deep ball. I think all three throw the deep ball very well. And I think that's what they're trying to do is, is push the ball down the field, what you haven't seen Georgia do in the past. But I, mean, I think it's a good pickup. I think I think you're looking at it as a bridge type player. I think you see Newman this year, you see uh, Daniels in 2021, and then um, work Vandegrift in slowly. And I saw somebody post, you don't want Vandegrift starting against Clemson as a freshman in the 2021 season, which is very true. So I think it gives Daniels a year to learn under um, Georgia's new offensive staff. Gives him a year to uh, uh, really develop. And I think uh, coming off the injury he had, I think this will be a good year for him to to to, to that. And I think it's a good landing spot. I think it's good. Um, I think he will he'll thrive in this type of offense. And um, and I just think it's a good fit all the way around for for both sides. Yeah, I kind of said all week, uh, you know, a lot of people ask the question about, um, you know, how does this affect this year? I don't really think it was a move made as much for this year as it was for next year. And I think that that's kind of the key takeaway from it. Um, you know, I think that this is Newman's job. I think that that's kind of the understanding. Um, look, I, I'm just I'm not saying that anybody's promised anything. But it's, you're going to have a harder time getting these transfer guys if you don't deliver, uh, especially in a grad transfer situation where a guy only has one year. Kirby Smart is going to play the best player possible. I understand that. But I do think that Newman, with the leadership that he's got, with the experience that he's got under his belt and how he fits into this offense kind of seamlessly, uh, first thing I think kind of uh, makes him the fit. But I will say with Daniels, Look, the hope should be from everybody that you, you talk about a bridge type player. The hope should be from everybody that you get Jamie Newman for one year, you get JT Daniels for one year, and then he's gone, and then Brock Vandegrift, because that would be uh, a, a very telling sign of how the season had gone for those guys. Right. Um, you know, I think that, uh, and I, I, I understand the concerns. Look, I do think that there probably will be some attrition uh, in the quarterback room at some point. Uh, you know, I'm looking at Carson Beck and Dwan Mathis. I know both of those guys are fierce competitors, both bring a lot to the table, but it's going to be interesting to see if in this world of college football where the transfer has become the norm more so than the exception, uh, if those guys decide to stick it out. I, I kind of have my doubts about it. I think that they'll look for some greener pastures. Uh, wouldn't it be something if Carson Beck – uh, ended up back in Florida after all of this. I'm not saying that's going to happen at all, but uh, you know, I think that it's just a, it's it's just a weird situation for everybody involved. But like I said, you got a you got a great player, a kid that, and I try to remind people of this: 17 years old that freshman year uh, in college, a kid that reclassified was going to be the number one player in the class of 2019. I mean, basically had it locked up. We thought it was going to be a wire to wire kind of thing. Just to show you how talented he is, reclassifies to 2018 and finishes fourth in the rankings behind two guys who look like generational quarterbacks in Trevor Lawrence, Justin Fields. And then obviously uh, a guy that w wouldn't be, uh, may not have been as high in the rankings had he not had JT Daniels throwing him the ball. And that was Amon Ross St. Brown, who he played with in Major D High School in uh, in California. So, um, you know, I think the kid's got a lot of upside. I agree that the year for him to kind of progress, get in this system, 
rehab the injury, you know, come back, kind of get his legs under him, but also sort of, you know, maybe I, you, you kind of mentioned the project aspect of it, Dane. And I think that there's an aspect of it that, that kind of allows Georgia to go through some of those mechanics this year that allows them to clean up some of the things, you know, you can't teach a kid to throw the deep ball. Like Trent said, like, like JT Daniels does. I mean, that's just a God given gift. You can either do that or you can't, but there are some things that can be cleaned up. And I think that it's a good situation with Todd Munkin uh, to, to be able to uh, get in there and work with this kid and uh, have an opportunity to kind of really refine some of those things. I, I'm interested how you guys think that, you know, this kind of, factors into the sec moving forward and, and does does it hurt with recruiting i mean does it hurt that that kirby smart keeps bringing in you know he brought in jamie newman he brought in uh now jt daniels i mean does that impact what kids think about this program going forward is there any concern of hey i, I you know i i'm not guaranteed a, 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 a I'm not, i may not even get a shot if they're going to keep doing this i mean i don't know Here's the thing we're talking about with uh, Carson Beck. I mean, the, the kid just arrived in Athens in December. I know it's the last six months have felt like an eternity with uh, with the pandemic around the U.S. But I mean, the kid the kid's really never been through a Georgia practice besides the bowl practices. I mean, he, he we missed spring football, so we really don't know what Carson Beck's going to bring um, uh, to the table. Um, there's a possibility that. You know, we see Newman this year, and Carson Beck comes in and beats them all out, and he's a quarterback in 2021. So uh, that that's one thing. I mean, I, th I think Carson Beck's talented. I think he's also the the raw type, the mechanics and stuff, and he could use a year of a red shirt. But um, that'll be an interesting battle next year um, when it comes in 2021 because you got Brock Vandergriff coming in, then you have uh, uh, Carson Beck with a year under his belt, and and also J T. Daniels. Uh, after a year in the system. So it'll be interesting to those 21 to see how all, all that works out with those three. If you look at the quarterbacks that have won national championships in recent years, for the most part, they're superstars. Now you can say, is that the team winning? And so then you get the stats and the Heisman thing. And uh, But in some cases, that's you have a Trevor Lawrence out there or you, know, you, you have a, a, a quarterback that just transcends the program to a different level. I think as a coaching staff, you have to be aggressive in pursuing every avenue to give yourself options at quarterback. Because if you miss, and I think we've seen this at Georgia in recent years, I'd say within the last decade for sure, uh, if you miss, it, it can ruin your entire season or at least put a cap on your season to, you know, once you get to the big boys and you have to beat one of the best five teams in the country, you, you just can't do that if your quarterback play is not – it, it can't just be average. They have to be elite playmakers to get to the level that George is trying to get to. And in some cases, that's where George has lacked in, in recent years. Um, so in that sense, I don't think it's going to hurt recruiting because it, it's just going to say, we're trying to get the most talent at quarterback that we can. And if you're willing to come here and compete for the job, which Brock Vandergriff and, and his father made such a great statement in that saying, yeah, this doesn't deter anything for, for us, that this is just going to be the norm at Georgia. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't think it'll impact recruiting. I do think the timeline for this particular one with Daniels may be interesting based on, and this is a question we have in the YouTube chat from Tim Casey, is the transfer actually going to be approved? Right now, we don't know. Uh, and that, that process has to play out. And, and Jake, you can speak to that a little bit more. Uh, but the timeline of where his college tenure fits may be funky with, with a couple guys in terms of who transfers out. I expect that'll probably happen with at least one guy. Uh, and then who comes in after that and what's their timeline from there? Yeah. And, yeah, you know, I, I, I keep, but people have asked the question a lot. Will the waiver be, uh, will it, will it go through? I, I really don't know. I don't think anyone does at this point. I do think that, you better believe that everybody is going to take every avenue possible to make that the case. And I think that you mentioned something, Dane, too, about, uh, you know, missing on some guys. I think it's just as important to look back on last season and, and think about the depth. You know, you had Jake Fromm, and behind that you had Stetson Bennett. And Stetson Bennett is a capable quarterback. He's a good kid, but he's not the guy that you want to put the program on the shoulders of, I, in my estimation. I think that Kirby Smart's kind of made that clear based on the people he's brought in, uh, you know, uh, uh, that, that, that look like they will be kind of uh, usurping him in the end. Um, but I, I think that 
you know, that it has to be as much of a concern as anything is, is building the depth and making sure that you're not limited in what you're able to do. Uh, because it, it's, you have to think that some of that was handcuffing Jake from last year from maybe just being able to extend plays and being able to get out there and make some things happen. I think that you had to be concerned about, you know, Jake going down and then all of a sudden uh, you're working with a totally different offensive game plan. You're not able to do any of the things that you're used to doing. Um, you know, I think that as far as the transfer goes and the, the uh, opportunity for the eligibility, I think that you will see Georgia try to say, look, well, and Daniels, I think probably first off uh, say, look, you know, we weren't even sure if California was going to be playing football this fall. So yeah, I think that that's going to be an interesting key to this. Uh, you know, how does that factor in? There's just so many unknowns around that piece of it. The good news is whether or not the transfer gets approved, the kids, get, I mean, if you got JT Daniels running your scout team this year, I think things are going to be going pretty well for you uh, moving forward. So uh, I, I like the opportunity of having the defense going up against him in any scenario. Uh, it, it's, it's not going to hurt if he's not approved. I think that that would provide some opportunity for guys like Carson Beck and Dwan Mathis to kind of get in and show what they're about and get some meaningful game reps as well but um you know i i don't I, it's it's a win-win for georgia in that sense i don't think that it matters whether or not he is or isn't to be honest with you this year and um you know moving forward I, there's been a lot of talk about vandegrift you obviously mentioned dane about his father's statement i'll tell you this uh if there's one thing that recruiting has taught me over the years it's that nothing's a for sure thing ever and if you've got an opportunity to bring a kid in, get him on campus and get him into the program immediately versus having to recruit a kid for a whole year and then it comes down to the last day and then he decides to go somewhere else, 10 out of 10, I take that opportunity. I mean, I, I just think that that is what it is. I, I, it's a bird in the hand uh, versus a two in the bush. I mean, I, I don't think that there's anything to worry about with Brock. I don't think that they're looking around. I don't, I'm sure your other teams are calling, um, but I don't think that it's something that Georgia has to be concerned with. Even still, we've learned over the years, I think not to necessarily just trust that first instinct and say, yeah, no, it'll be fine. Yeah. In, in that think, sense too, the, the, like, you know, Georgia's going to have to be careful because if JT Daniels could still grad transfer at some point, if he's not liking his scenario. So, you know, this is not some long-term marriage for sure with him either. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, th I think what's, uh, I think what Kirby has done and he, he's, he doesn't want to get into another situation like he's been in the past two years, you know, he had Justin Fields. Then you, you have that, you have that scenario where you only have what they had from and Fields, and then East and the transfer out, but he's been with two or three, so like last year too, scholarship quarterbacks on campus at the same time. I said he's going to make sure that room's full, whether it's by transfer or by um, the recruiting in high school, and he's going to make sure that room's full each and every year. I mean, it, it's it's got five in it now, so it's a long ways from last year's two. Yeah, no, no kidding. Well, and you know, you, one of the main focuses of, for Kirby Smart when he came in to Georgia was re restoring the trenches. He made such a big focus about let's rebuild the offensive line, let's rebuild the defensive line. I'm not saying the the defensive line necessarily is done. The offensive line is pretty well taken care of moving forward. I think that it's fair to say that, but. I think that he realized immediately, too, just how important it was in this era of college football to have, you know, those multiple options. I mean, look at Alabama, the team that, you know, was able to beat Georgia twice uh, and, and how they did it. It was because you swapped out Jalen Hurts for uh, Tua Tagovailoa, and then you swapped Tua for Jalen Hurts. And the opportunity to just have that back and forth, I think, is something that probably stuck with him and and – you know, gives them the opportunity to say, look, we've got to be as deep here as we are anywhere because there's nothing more important than this if we're going to win and win in the way that we need to. Here's a question on the YouTube chat kind of about JT Daniels. This is from uh, Not Just Rocks. This is, what are your concerns about Daniels' negative rushing yards? What are the causes of that? Uh, well, the main cause is that sack numbers account for negative rushing yards, and he was sacked quite a lot in that 2018 season when he started. Yeah, I, and and for me, that's a concern of 
I, I mentioned this before he kind of came on the air. I hope it's not a, a David Carr situation where, you know, he was drafted number one overall by the Texans when they became the, when, when, when they became a franchise and, you know, it just kind of ruined his career that he was torn up uh, behind the offensive line. It'll be interesting to see if that reinstills something in Daniels to uh, really know that he can put some faith in those guys up in front of him. I think that, that could be a big key for him moving forward. And make no, uh, no mistake, he is not a running quarterback. He is a pocket passer. He will not I – mean, yeah, he can scramble. He may can extend a play. He's not going to be rushing for 45 yards a game. It's just not happening with him. Yeah. No, I, I agree. I could see that. Um, I, and here's one interesting wrinkle on the quarterback situation because I, I, this is something I think a lot of people have kind of made this point. If someone begins to kind of look around one of the current quarterbacks at Georgia at a transfer, and this is just incredible massive speculation, so there is no reporting happening on this. But if that were to happen, I'm just saying Mel Tucker is at Michigan State and one of the current Georgia quarterbacks is from the state of Michigan. Just saying. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. I think that's certainly a, a consideration to make. Um, speaking of considerations, uh, get out to see our friends over at Athens Ford. Uh, 678 vehicles available right now on the lot. Uh, they've got pickup and delivery options available for sales and service. So, hey, you don't want to get out, out of the house, they'll bring one by for you to test drive. Uh, they've got uh, basically everything taken care of for you. Uh, buy a car in under 90 minutes. They're trying to give you every avenue to make it as seamless and easy of a process as they can. And Athens Ford is the place where you're going to find that, I think, uh, far and above uh, more than any dealership in the area. Um, so go by, check those guys out. Uh, like I said, and we've, we've said several times, 84 months, 0% financing. You can stretch those payments out if things are uh, tight right now and you need a vehicle. Um, and don't forget the lifetime powertrain warranty out there at Athens Ford. They do it all uh, brand new vehicles and used vehicles under 80,000 miles. So give them a call, 844-442-4432. And uh, like I said, hey, you want to test drive the brand new uh, F-150, they'll swing it by the house and uh, give you a shot at it. Um, we got a couple questions here that I did want to touch on on the – uh, Daniel's situation as well as some other quarterback questions. Uh, so let's dive right in there. Uh, ASU dog uh, with a good one here, guys. He says, uh, if JT Daniels is eligible, eligible for this season, do you see him getting in some game reps? I think you would, I mean, I think you would want to get him in some game reps. Uh, at least for, you know, take your minimum red shirt, four games and then that way he's still if he if he was to get a medical red shirt one day he still have that uh but i mean i think you'd play him i mean why not why would you get him reps i think that would that would really push him if, if you feel like after practicing he's gonna he's gonna be that second guy then then of course you play him i think you, you go ahead and and get in those reps and, and and get in that game uh type situations against the sec I agree, and but I, I do think it's important, and I think we've done this well, but for fans, I think this may turn into a quarterback competition for the 2020 season. Barring injury, this is Jamie Newman's job. I agree. I agree. Um, I, I think that uh, I, I really just don't see a way that it, it, it's not. Now, uh, we do got a question from a guy, and this one of the most hilarious uh, uh, names on the, uh, the, the dog vent. Uh, Whiskey and Weed wants to know um, if Newman wins the job and beats Alabama, but then gets shaky, do you think Kirby considers a QB chain? Do you, do you think that we could see the possibility to see a shakeup? Personally, I'll, I'll start off on this one. I think that every single week in at Georgia is best man goes. And, and I know that you want some continuity up front. I know you want some continuity at the quarterback position. You want – guys being able to feel comfortable and know where they're going. But Kirby Smart is not going to leave a guy in there, in my estimation, just because he's won one game or he's played a couple good games. It, if, if he feels that there's a better chance for Daniels or whoever it might be uh, to win a game for him, I think that's the move he's going to make. I don't think that he's a, it's a situation where you're going to see – loyalty just for the sake of loyalty but but like i said that's my opinion like where do you guys stand on this one yeah i mean i think so too i think uh i 
I, mean, I agree 100 percent what you're saying it's uh, jt daniels um i think i think newman's the guy i think uh to start the season kirby smart won't tell you that to probably september 7th or, or even if he tells you at all but um i think it's newman's job but you start to struggle a little bit and i think you're going to see you know one of the other ones come in i think he was i think the jake Fromm situation i think he was more Tied to Jake Fromm, especially coming off his freshman year with his uh, with helping lead Georgia to the national championship, and I think he, you know, he, he felt like Jake Fromm. He had confidence. In Jake Fromm. He he, he was it, Fromm had shown that he could do the job, and and so he didn't make the switch to to, to Fields. But uh, but I think I think right moving forward, I think Smart's gonna play the best guy. I think he's gonna play the, the if it's Carson Beck, it's Carson Beck. If it's um, Jamie Newman is Jamie Newman. I think he's going to play the best guy, and I think that's the way you have to. I think that's – I mean, there's no other way to go about it. Um, speaking of which, Jake, Jake can, can you name um, – can you name Jake Daniels right tackle when he was at USC? Oh, uh, Jamie Daniels right tackle. Was, was it uh, was no. it EJ Price? No. It was okay. Chuma. <laughs> oh, was it Chuma? Oh, okay. Chuma. It's, it's hard for me to believe Chuma still was still in college. I mean, Chuma felt like he was one of those guys that I covered when I first got on the when I first got into this. And the fact that he's even still around. I mean, we've seen you know we've seen two classes of kids go to the NFL by that time. So, uh, <laughs> but but Chuma's a great one, man. And I I think that uh, you know he was doing his part. I don't know about the other guys, but uh, I, I think that Chuma was definitely doing his part. Uh, now, I got one for you, Dane. Uh, this is a, a good one since you've been watching the film and doing the deep dives on that. Uh, Dallas Dog 225 says, where is Daniel similar to from? And then how are they different? He says, to me, they seem very comparable. I think Daniel's played with a bit more freedom that from probably wanted to play with. But for whatever reason, whether it be the receiver production or maybe that he didn't want to get hurt or, or there were a variety of reasons that Fromm just seemed to play a little tentative. From what I, you know, this is the classic quarterback thing, right? JT Daniels looks like a gunslinger. And, and a piece of that is because he's got some funky arm angles at points because he's got the power to generate a really strong pass pretty much from his hip if he needs to, which is the definition of a gunslinger. Um, he can do some things that, that most quarterbacks just cannot do, which is kind of impressive. Um, I think Fromm wanted to do more of that. I think Fromm wanted to play faster. I think Fromm wanted to play more of a spread. I think he wanted to do more what he was comfortable in high school. That's just not what George's offense was. For whatever reason, you can assign the blame. I think we've all done that over the course of the past year. Uh, but Fromm was, uh, as a whole, a more accurate passer. He was a safer player. He did not throw as many possible uh, interceptions or turnovers. I mean, JT Daniels touchdown to turnover ratio. I mean, I think it was like 14 touchdowns to 11 interceptions. It, it's not very impressive. Um, and Fromm was always way safer than that. So um, I think Daniels arm strength is there more, but Fromm was definitely more polished. Who would you say is the more more mobile of the two? I, I personally, I, I tend to lean toward Daniels as the guy who's probably going to get out there and extend plays a little bit more. But is that what you've seen on tape? I actually think Fromm probably had more <laughs> running ability, but again, in the offense and then the depth behind him, you just didn't see that as much. If you go back to uh, Fromm when he took over the job in seventeen, I mean, didn't he have? Uh, I think two rushing touchdowns in the same quarter against Tennessee. I mean, he was a, a threat to run the ball a little bit. I just didn't see that as much from Daniels. He, he didn't. And again, look, Daniel started as an 18 year old in, in big time college football. And I know Fromm was young when he started too, but uh, it was a tough spot for a kid that should have been a high school senior. Yeah. I mean, he should have been enjoying prom and instead he was out just getting his ass lit up in the back 12 by, you know, brutal pass rushers. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, I mean, I think anybody would struggle in that situation, to be honest with you. I, I, you know, obviously none of us are super talented athletes or we wouldn't be sitting here doing this. We'd be somewhere throwing a football, but I think that would be difficult for anybody. If you'd, put me in that situation at 17 years old uh that's just a lot to process and and to go from you know being able to switch it up so fast from going to high school to make that jump to college and then thrown into the fire immediately um 
it's you know it's that's a lot it's a lot to, it's a lot to undertake uh, and, and, and his they, knee injury is something to monitor in, in terms of running especially in the sec true. uh how much faith is he going to have in that knee most acl tears at this point it's a it's a clean uh, recovery a quick recovery and people tend to be stronger than before they they tore it that's how college football goes now but if he's one of the few cases that were not to happen, you just got to see what he's comfortable doing and how quick he is comfortable doing it. <laughs> I saw that air piece pop out. <laughs> and wait I kept going. Through. Did you notice? Way to, way to play through, man. Way to play through it. <laughs> uh, that was impressive. <laughs> um, let's see here. Um, oh, well, uh, speaking of quarterbacks, a good one here from BSW44144. Uh, for both of you guys, he says, who is the best quarterback in the SEC going into this year? Ooh, silence, radio silence. Everybody having to, uh, to, to, to think through this one a little bit. A lot of them left, so. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's pretty wide open in that regard. I, I'm, I, tend, to, I tend to lean toward um, uh, Trask. Uh, just because uh, he did some good things. I, I really like uh, uh, Mac Jones. I think that he's got a lot of tools to work with too, which really benefits him um, and, and should be uh, impactful for him. Um, who's at South Carolina right now? I don't even know. Uh, is it? It's not. It's Dad Joyner, is It's it Ryan Helensky. Yeah, that's right, Helensky. And you know, I can see him having a having a good campaign. I think that he's a, a kid that was real talented coming out of high school. But I'm not ready to put him up in the, the upper echelon just yet. Um, I don't know. We, we got to see what LSU is all Bo, about too. Sure, sure. I think Bo Nix is one to watch with the new offense coordinator. And, and uh, there you go. That's the right, right answer. <laughs> I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to like cater to the audience on a show about UGA football, but I really think it's going to be Jamie Newman. Understand. Homer. (laughs) (laughs) I I think from what I've seen in the film breakdown that I have and the confidence that I have in Todd Munkin to work with him, I think Jamie Newman will be a first round NFL quarterback next year. Listen, he says the guy wearing red and black on the show. We can see where, (laughs) we can see where this is all headed. Um, I do want to give a shout out uh, quick before we move on to our uh, our next topic because we got a lot to talk about. Peach and prosciutto pizza season is back. Mm. I think that's probably what I'm having for dinner tonight uh, because I just realized it was going on uh, over at your pie. Uh, make sure to get out there and check it out. If you've never had this one, unbelievable. Fresh peaches, prosciutto, basil, olive oil, honey balsamic glaze, some uh, mozzarella, ricotta, and Parmesan. It's uh, it's a party in your mouth and everyone's invited. So uh, get out there and see them. Uh, definitely check out the Your Pie app as well. They make it easy for you to earn rewards, get an opportunity to uh, stack up some free pizza over time. And uh, I believe, Dane, you mentioned last week they got some, uh, what, free cheese sticks or a free cheese pizza. Uh, just for Yeah, I think if you get there. the app right now, at least I saw this, I hope this is right, uh, because I used to work at a PR agency that worked with some of your pie. I think I saw that if you get the app right now, uh, for the first time, free cheese sticks on there. And who doesn't love free cheese sticks? Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, remember, you can build you can build your pie online. Uh, you can build it through the app. Uh, they'll have it piping hot and ready for you. Or if you want to go in uh, and uh, maybe grab something quick, uh, I know that they've got uh, the opportunity to do that. So get out there, peach and prosciutto pizza back this season, and it is a winner. It is it hits now. Uh, uh, Jay, be- before you get to yeah. this next question, because uh, Green's the Green Soldier in the YouTube chat has been asking some great questions, so I want to get him in on one final quarterback thing before we s- switch over. And I think it's a good point. He's saying, "Would you say that Daniels and Carson Beck should get close to the same amount of game reps?" And I think that's important to note the experience that Daniels brings in, having played college football for now twelve games as a starter. That's something that no other quarterback that Georgia has other than Jamie Newman. So I think that that point is important to make. But in terms of game reps, where does Carson Beck fit into any of this? Well, where, where does Dwan Mathis fit into any of this? I think that that's the other thing that's got to be answered. And I, to me, if, if Daniels is eligible, I, I see the, the breakdown going uh, Jamie, Daniels, and then those two fighting for the three spot. 
And I don't think that there's any harm, though, in giving that third guy as many reps as the second guy, because you're talking about guys who don't have that game experience versus a guy who has a lot of it in major college football. So uh, I, I tend to think that you, you should even it out, but uh, I, I'll throw that one to Trent as well. I'm interested in his take on it. Well, I, don't, I, I think they're going to use Beck in four games. I don't think they're going to use Beck in more than four games. So, um, so it just depends on if that's one of the four games he gets called, his number called. So I, th I think he's going to get four games, and I think the, the rest of the season you're going to see as a backup is uh, Daniels. And well, we're we're forgetting about the mailman who was, you know, second in line last year. So, uh, so he's going to be somewhere in the mix. I think, and I think Kirby will try to get him snaps. At some point during the season, uh, um, with the mailman, but I, I, it, it'd Just be like hard to figure the out. That, it never, it never fails to make me smile to hear the, the, the his name. Like, you get you, the mailman is the best. It's the best. <laughs> I, mean, I, I don't remember him coming out of high school and him saying, "I just deliver it, baby. I'm the mailman." So, and, and he had the hat. Remember, he had the uh, he had yeah. the PS hat too, which I just thought was the coolest touch, man. That was that was that was a kid who was marketing before it was cool to be marketing. So, shout yeah. out to Stenson for that, dude. I, I will uh, say that those four games that are selected that players can play in and still get the red shirt, man, that's that's so crucial for coaches because in this era where if you're not in the national championship hunt in your bowl game then you're going to have a lot of people either sitting out or not playing for a variety of reasons. Um, you kind of want to make sure that for a lot of these players, you save that bowl game for them in case a spot at their position opens up that wouldn't have otherwise been open. I think they've done that the last couple of years too. I mean, I know there's a few injuries with uh, like divide Wilson and disease, but I mean, last year they, they held um, Rochester out the last you know, three weeks of the season, so he'd be ready for the SEC championship and all that stuff. So I think you, you've seen that uh, Kirby play his cards right in that with, with the red shirts. So I think he's played. I think he's done uh, a good job in that department. Um, all right, we've had, talked a lot about quarterbacks, and I expect honestly that we could probably spend the rest of the show talking about JT Daniels and how that may shape things moving forward. But like I said, two more commits uh, this week. Um, this past week, actually, uh, and I, I want to start with the guy for 2021, um, just because he's the immediate class, and that's Dylan Fairchild. Trent, uh, I know you had a chance to go in and break down the film on him. Dane, you helped uh, put some gifts together for that as well. Uh, Trent, just kind of talk us through this guy. What do you see out of this kid? What do you like about the film? And uh, and and just what kind of player is Georgia getting in Fairchild? I mean, the first thing that stands out to me is he's he's not a type offensive lineman that that Sam Pittman might have recruited. He is the Sam Pittman might have recruited him, but he's the more uh, he's just athletic. I mean he is uh, I think he's a guy that you could play at attack with you can have a crunch on. He is uh, probably gonna play on the inside. He's athletic. He's strong as ox. He went like 48 and 48 and 0 last year in wrestling. Um so he won a state championship. He is uh, he's, he he lines up at D tackle on defense and and he's very there. He plays with he has a good leverage. I think he could use some strength uh, in the upper body a little bit. But I think he I mean Brooks a, a gamer. He's been a, an athletic guy that can get up screens, pull, and uh, I mean he's just a good. He's he's not not a huge. Not a huge player like like Pittman, bro. Like I say, listen, he's like, like win and just go get out and be able and, and be able to block the space. And just just another good pick up from Matt Luke. Yeah, uh, Dane, uh, what did what did you see when you were breaking down those gifts, buddy? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a similar thing for anyone thinking that this is someone the size of Isaiah Wilson coming into Georgia's program. One, that just doesn't happen often at all for anybody. Uh, there may be a few <laughs> out there, but I mean, he's just massive. Uh, you know, I, I, I think it's valuable to be able to add to an ever-rotating cast of offensive linemen because Georgia is becoming an offensive line new in a lot of ways where really talented players will be at Georgia for three years and gone. You had the Cade Mays transfer, so that opened up a little bit of a, a hole that needed to be filled in terms of depth uh, going forward. And, uh, you know, I just think that whenever you can keep a talented offensive lineman in the state especially, that's 
that's really crucial for Matt Luke to be building those relationships with coaches and being able to make his mark among these high schools uh, in the state of Georgia because it's an area that, yeah, he recruited some when he was at Ole Miss, but it's just a different thing when it's you're the, the home state school, right? So, um, you know, this is going to go a long way in pursuing a couple of the other offensive linemen in this class as well. Uh, it's a great pickup. I think he's got a chance to play a lot of football at Georgia. Um, but that's also not guaranteed because of the amount of talent around him either. He's going to have to work for it. Yeah, I, I think that I definitely agree with one of the things that you said. And I was going to actually say the same thing. I think that the kid's got a chance to play a lot at the next level. I think that he's a guy that you're going to see become kind of a stalwart on this line or at least have the opportunity to because of the things that he does well. And, uh, you know, I, I did the what it means, what's next. <clears throat> when you watch that film, man, this kid is aggressive. That's the big thing that jumps off the screen to me. He is a he is a play through the whistle. I want to throw you on the ground, and then I want to sit on top of you, and I want to embarrass you, kind of lineman. And I love that about a guy, especially with a wrestling background. Um, you know, that keeps him light on his feet. He's able to adjust really easily. And, uh, you know, I think he's strong. And I, I've mentioned this in the, the thing. <clears throat> it will not surprise me, and I don't say this very often about – young offensive lineman because it's a hard spot to uh, kind of come in and contribute right away. I think that he's a kid with the tools and with the, um, you know, you, you throw him in strength training, you get him in nutrition. I think he's got the tools that make him a valuable asset from the jump and, and maybe a guy who can compete uh, when he gets to campus because I think that he does so many things so well. Um, I, I expect a big bump in the rivals rankings for him too, before the end of things are uh, all said and done. But, um, you know, it, I, I like it too, uh, selfishly because uh, that's just not a school you see Georgia recruit very often. I think Patrick Garvin, I don't even know if he was able to find anybody that Georgia had ever had from West Forsyth. I know they're a newer school, so it's, it, it makes a little bit of sense, but um, you know, just cool to see, see the footprint expanded. I always love uh, for a school to, you know, get that opportunity and to get out there as well. So uh, good for West Forsyth, good for Dylan Fairchild. I mean, he wanted the Georgia offer. He was a kid that, you know, grew up rooting for the Bulldogs, whole family's Bulldog. Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of reason for optimism around this kid. And uh, I think Georgia fans have a lot to be excited about in that pickup. And as you mentioned, you keep a guy in state, you got two more to get. And that's the, the laundry list uh, of the, the, how the offensive line should shake out. Amarius Mims and Terrence Ferguson. Trent, uh, how are you feeling about those two? Um, you know, I, I thought I'd been hearing with Mims that Bama was gaining some ground. But uh, over the last couple of months, I've heard a lot more Georgia involved there. Um, I mean, I, if you if you go four for four on the four in-state guys, I mean, just wrap it up and just – that, that, and that's a remarkable class. I mean, I, I, I said at the beginning of this class that there was no chance that they landed the big three. I just didn't think all three would come in the same class. And uh, and add Fairchild to it. If you land up the, the big three, Fairchild along with it's a blue class. But right now, I, I do I do feel good about the Georgia's chances to, to go four for four right now. Um, and if, if Matt Luke and Kirby Smart can pull that off, with, with what they have on, on campus, it's just uh, remarkable. Yeah, oh, if I, they pull the four for four, they're going to be strutting around Athens. I yeah, mean, <laughs> and not that's, just Brock Vandergriff, too. That's a yeah. better deal than Wendy's four for four, baby. I'm telling you right now. That, they, they can get out there. This is – look, this is the most talented in-state lineman class, I think, that there's been in some time, um, you know, uh, several years at least. I think the opportunity for Georgia to get all four of those guys, that's 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 on par with some of the better classes they've ever had because you're talking about the number one offensive tackle in the nation in Amarius, uh, a kid who has pretty much limitless upside. I do think Amarius is a little bit raw um, right now and, and is a guy that they'll take some time to develop, but there's no way you can create a human being to look like that. Um, so you, you just he does he does things so well. He's so strong. And it's so big. Uh, Micah is uh, just an absolute brick of a human being. Um, you know, he's one of those kids that if his if his shoulders weren't so large that, that if he had a neck, he'd be you know six foot six as well. Um, uh, Terrence Ferguson, the long, lean guy. I love those Peach County guys as well. And then you got Fairchild, who's the wrestler, and and uh, I, I love that. So I, I think that uh, would be an impressive haul. I mean, just I love the. the just 
just Sorry, imagine John. having uh, Mims, Robert Jones, Tate Ratledge, Terrence Ferguson. I mean, it's unreal. You will what what how they keep recruiting like they're recruiting on the offensive line and and be able to do it in back to back classes. I mean, it's just it's amazing. Yeah. Sure. And we're talking about, you know, I mean, that's that's even leaving off guys who come in like a guy like a Chad Lindbergh, you know, with his 5.0 GPA and his massive size. I mean, the kid's a, a giant freak. You got Devin Willock, who's like six seven three thirty out of New Jersey. He's totally raw, but a kid who who knows what the, the upside is on a guy like that. Uh, you know, Warren Erickson's a guy that played in that bowl game last year. What will we see from him? Um Warren McClendon is another one, you know, I, I, a guy that I can't, I thought coming out of high school was a five position player, could go anywhere across the line. Xavier Trust was talked about as a guy who could be in contention for left tackle spot. I mean, it feels like every single one of these guys has a chance to contribute. And uh, you've got to think that that kind of competition is going to allow Georgia to put a really superior product on the field, not only this year, but, but moving forward for several years. They put themselves in a great spot. And whoever the scout team quarterback is is going to have a good offensive line too. So. <laughs> no question. Yeah, you got to think those young defensive linemen are going to be cutting their teeth against some uh, some pretty ridiculous uh, some some pretty ridiculous uh, talent. Uh, speaking of ridiculous talent, I do want to talk about our friends over at Aaron Overhead Doors. We talk about them every week, uh, but it's because they're good folks doing good stuff. Uh, best of Gwinnett, 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019. I can sure 2020 is in the play as well. Uh, Humanitarian Award 2019. Um, you know, they're a part of the International Door Association. And as we always say, a customer service company in the garage door business, a, a group of guys that really focuses more on the experience and the opportunity to serve people more so than sell you something that you uh, may not need. So uh, give them a call, get out there to see them. Uh, they have a wide service area, covers a lot of um, uh, a lot of North Georgia, but hey, they can help you out, I think, uh, pretty much anywhere if you give them a chance. 678-960-3360. And don't forget, 10% off of any work Aaron Overhead Doors does uh, when you just tell them you're a UGA fan. And right now seems like a uh, good time to be hopping on that train. Um, uh, all right, we talked to Fairchild. We talked to uh, Dylan, or, uh, uh, we talked to through Daniels, we talked through Fairchild. Now let's dive in. 2022 gets things rolling. Uh, huge pickup, I thought, to start that class off. It's weird. It was weird to me that that class hadn't already started because the 2023 commit had been in for so long uh, in Trayon Webb. So Georgia had 2021 rolling and already somebody for 2023. 2022 was sitting there kind of barren until last week. And you get Marquise Groves, Killebrew, like we said, out of Brookwood High School. Um, Trent, uh, I don't know if you've had a chance to see him play in person or not, but uh, have you watched the film on this guy? And uh, what have you seen? I do. Uh, you know about the offensive line uh, a few months ago. The, the defensive back recruitment has been just as impressive. Uh, bringing in guys uh, in, like – Marino and you know, the number quarterback in this class, and then you, 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 if you add in, he's, I mean, you just keep reloading that position. Um, he's a, he's a young kid, of course, a big kid, long kid, uh, kid play on the boundary. He's, um, he plays physical. He, I like I, I, I like this film, yeah. But uh, from what I've seen, another topic in the trees. And uh, he's more tough, uh, similar in size. He's, he's a big body, six foot one eighty. He uh, he's just that cornerback that that. Kirby's been looking for and recruiting over the past couple of years, and, and that room's really uh, gotten a lot better. I might, I might have to bust out my decoder ring for some of that trick. You got a little fuzzy on us there a couple of times. Yeah, Trent, so. your internet sucks, Trent. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, down there, down there in the pan room, I think I think the uh, the Wi-Fi extender may uh, may have to penetrate those walls a little harder. Um, but I do agree with some of the things you were saying. You're talking about a kid, you know, playing on the boundary and and what he's able to do. I think. You know, this is not a kid that I've had a chance to, to see up close and personal just yet, uh, but I do uh, uh, plan to do so this season because 
that tape is impressive as hell. Um, that's a that's a good looking cornerback tape. And what I love about the kid, <clears throat> he's very comfortable being on an island, which is obviously a, a major uh, factor. If you're going to be playing that position, you're going to be put on those islands. Grayson last year certainly trusted him and gave him that opportunity to be out there with guys uh, and, and have the opportunity to, uh, you know, be in one on one coverage and see what he can do. Very capable when it comes to stripping the ball, uh, even after a guy's reeled it in, you know, he's he's in there uh, still disrupting catches. And I think that that's impressive. And the biggest thing, though, and I think that this is probably something that prob- that has to excite Kirby Smart as, as much as anything about that kid's game is when you just see him come up and run support and just stick a man at the offense right at the line of scrimmage. Uh, that's something that, that Kirby values in those guys. He wants guys that are going to get in there, be physical, be aggressive, and, um, you know, not just play sometimes. With, we, we see a lot of finesse uh, from the, the cornerbacks, obviously, and some guys, that's their thing. But uh, I think uh, Groves Killebrew looks like a guy who can do a little bit of it all uh, tremendous start to the class. And also, I reminded people, too, pretty uh, pretty on brand for Georgia to start a recruiting class with a defensive back. Uh, Richard LeCount did that. Uh, you, you started uh, this cycle with David Daniel uh, out of Woodstock. So, um, you know, those guys, hey, they talk a lot of smack. They're used to, uh, you know, getting getting out there and mixing it up with guys. And I think that uh, I, I think Grimm's Killebrew is, is a good guy to have leading the way and certainly to have on your commit list. That's uh, that's that's going to be a tremendous one. I, I expect George is going to have to fight uh, in the long term to keep that kid uh, uh, committed because everybody's going to want a piece of him and his game. He reminds me a lot of like Devon Wilson, the way they, they can come up and run support and, and, and also cover. I think he could play. He's, he's a Kirby Smart type guy. He can play three or four different positions and excel at them all because of his, his hitting ability and his coverage skills. Two things about Groves Killebrew to me. One, optics-wise, Georgia getting a victory in the Grayson-Snellville area that's been kind of touchy, <laughs> to, yeah. to say the least. That's a big deal uh, for Georgia to, to be able to keep some – you know, someone that's an hour away from campus, essentially, but it, sometimes it would feel like across the country. Um, the other thing, and, and Jim Donnan uh, told told me this uh, on our Donnan and Dane podcast, which you can find this on the same feed that you find our audio podcast for UGA Sports Live. He said, if you watch the film of Groves Killebrew going up against Arik Gilbert, he handled him pretty well. And for the talent that Gilbert has, handling him pretty well, that's as much of a compliment as you can wow, give. Pull that up. As a sophomore, too, that's what's that's also important to note. I mean, you're watching that kid handle a guy who's headed to LSU as a five-star recruit. Uh, you know, people believe has every tool in the bag to be a first-round pick at the tight end position, and a sophomore in there, you know, playing real well against him. So, uh, tell you, an nobody, impressive mark. nobody in the last two years, or nobody that I saw, has been able to slow down. Eric Gilbert. So uh, <laughs> just the fact that, that he was able to contain him. I mean, if he held him to under 100 yards, it, 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 it would have been um, an impressive performance. I, I wouldn't want to have to stop that guy. I know that. Uh, <laughs> uh, speaking of making stops, though, get out to academia, make a stop by there. Uh, tons of beer on tap. Uh, you can get it in Crowlers. You can get it uh, in six packs. Uh, you can get it in the bar uh, at the at, at the brewery. Um, you know, it's not going to get any more fresh than that. Uh, several beers on tap right now. They got the Dom Kolsch, Academia Premium Lager, Extra Credit ESB, the Shiver Pilsner, uh, Yesterday's Eyes Pilsner, Real Situation Sour Berliner Weiss. A uh, little something for everybody. You want the hoppy stuff, they got the IQ IPA, 55 IBUs on that. Uh, I have spoken IPA. You want something a little cloudier, a little juicier, uh, go get the staircase to nowhere. Um, just something for everybody when it comes to uh, when it comes to the beer out at Academia Brewing and uh, something for everybody when it comes to their menu as well. I preach every week, go out and get those wings, man. They got some killer wings out there at Academia. They make them upright. Jake, what's your go-to academia beer? Because you're you're one of my trusted beer guys. <laughs> uh, well, I appreciate that. First off, um, I'm really into their sours. I haven't had the uh, real situation yet, but I definitely need to get out there and try that one. Um, I, they do a great job with all their sours, though, 
and I'm a hot head, so uh, a good old IQ IPA uh, really gets me where, everywhere I need to be. So uh, go, uh, go, go check them out. Like I said, they got something for everybody, um, and I've yet to have a bad beer there, which is an impressive thing to say for anybody uh, in the beer, in the beer brewing game. Uh, and if you want to swing by our friends at classic city eats, uh, and they've got it on tap as well. Uh, you can grab some academia out there, uh, plus all kinds of local craft beer as well. Uh, and they've got everything you need from small plates to uh, 20 piece meals for the family with two large sides. So, um, get out, check it out. They've got the hush puppy basket, uh, fried green tomatoes, the smoked sausage is still on point. Um, we get that almost every time we're out there and, uh, you know, swing by, try the sauces too. order one of each and, uh, let me know what you like. The hickory sauce is my recommendation, but that barbecue heat hits as well. So, uh, give our friends at classic city Eats to try and, uh, academia brewing as well. Got a guys, question here from the uh, YouTube yeah. chat for you guys that uh, I think you get quite often. And this is for class of 2021. Do you see any potential attrition in terms of what this looks like for a scholarship limit coming up? So that's kind of what you guys crunch the numbers on of where's Georgia at in terms of total scholarships. And that changes when you get a surprise like a JT Daniels. But just what are you guys seeing in terms of what 2021 turns into numbers wise? <laughs> Trent, you go ahead and start that one. <laughs> I'll say this. Kirby's going to take the max he can get every single year, and he's going to work his numbers out. I mean, <laughs> it'll work out. I don't know how he does it sometimes. And then, I mean, I don't care how he does it. I don't, I don't, sometimes I, I, it's better not to know, but he's going to take the max he can take. Numbers will work for himself. So. Look, I, I took one math class in college. I'm terrible at math. I can't do it. I don't know how it works. I don't understand it. I sure as hell don't understand George's fuzzy math in order to get all these kids in. I don't know how they're taking 25 and 26 a year. I don't know how they're massaging the numbers for it. I don't know how you're moving guys out, um, you know, but it, it's happening. And like Trent said, uh, until I see otherwise, I think Georgia is going to shoot for 25 in this class and every class. They want to restock with fresh talent. And if they got to move on from a guy when he gets on the campus, they'll do it. I mean, I think that they've proven a willingness to do that, too. So um, I, I look for 25. <laughs> you know, we keep trying every year to be like, well, maybe 21, 23. Every year, once signing day hits, uh, there's 27 somehow, that which is even above the NCAA limit. I don't even know how they're doing it. Uh, but those guys are masters when it comes to ro mo roster management and numbers management. I, I give them a lot of credit. I, I really think that that's one of uh, the more underappreciated things that Kirby Smart has changed at Georgia in a big way. And I think one thing they're doing is taking – they're probably putting the, the number of kids that we we've, we've thought they were going to take all year on scholarship and they're taking three or so and putting them on gray shirts and they're pushing their scholarship doing some kind of whatever color shirt they got and uh, they're pushing the scholarship back you know a semester and then they're just going to roll that to next class and then they're going to do the same thing next class and roll that to next class and some somewhere along the way they're they won't have any scholarships left, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, but uh, the 20, the 2028 season, it's just going to be, you can't take anybody any longer. <laughs> There's no recruiting for 2028 because the, the numbers have been massaged so long. <laughs> but somehow they found a loophole where they could just keep pushing stuff, pushing stuff, pushing stuff. And they just, uh, I'm convinced they're just going to take 25, 26 every year. Just way it's going to be. I agree. I agree. Um, all right, guys, uh, any parting thoughts this week? Anything you want to share? Anything uh, you got coming up? Dane, I know you said that you guys were uh, looking a little film don't lie on old JT Daniels. Uh, when can we expect to see that, maybe? Uh, let's see. I think Brent Rollins is uh, kind of doing some of his data crunching since uh, none of us are good at math. So we had to find someone <laughs> else that is. And Brent's really good at that with his uh, PFF grades. So expecting that probably uh, later this week. And then uh, we do have our big reveal coming of who is the number one top returning bulldog based on PFF grades from uh, the 2019 season. So we've had our countdown. There are 21 players that had a grade of 70 or higher with, I forget the exact number, but they'd have a, a minimum number of snaps. And uh, we are up to the number one spot. Number two was George Pickens. So we got to go back through and uh, watch a lot of great George Pickens catches, which, man, they're almost more impressive the second time around. And I don't know if you guys saw it, but we found a run block that he had against Auburn. My God, 
Uh, we don't talk about George Pickens and run blocking that much, but we need to because yeah. he's got it. And it was Auburn. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you think that was a little uh, a little uh, uh, reminder of, hey, just so you guys remember. <laughs> he's pretty good at, he's pretty good at the um, ultimate fighting too. I mean, he, he slammed the deck. <laughs> We we didn't include that in this particular piece, but I think everyone remembers the the tech punch out, and uh, you know some people gave him grief for that. I'm like, yeah, you know, did it hurt Georgia against LSU? Maybe a little bit, but I don't think if he was there the whole time, it would have made that much of a difference. So at least you get that fun memory. Uh, Trent, Trent, can we uh, maybe expect some uh, film breakdown on uh, Groves Killebrew later this week? Yeah, and I'm finishing up uh, one on JT Daniels as well, so I should have a couple couple coming this week. Beautiful, man. Excellent stuff. Well, uh, I just put up who's next uh, yesterday. So get by and check that out. Five guys that you need to be keeping tabs on when it comes to UGA recruiting. Uh, Stop by and make sure to see that one if you haven't. Uh, I think that Georgia could get some good news here in the next week or so. Um, I I don't think that you're that far off of another commit. Roddy's still out of town, so that means the good luck's still rolling. Uh, yeah, Roddy stays out of town. I don't know that Roddy really <laughs> lives in Athens any longer, to be honest with you. Do you uh, know how people are going to revolt if Roddy comes back in and there's a decommitment? Like, it's, <laughs> it's going to be his fault. Or an arrest, perhaps. No, <laughs> so, normally, that's normally that's for Dash's vacation. So, uh, normally, the bad team stuff happens when Dash is gone, and the positive recruiting stuff happens when Roddy's gone. So, um and then when I'm gone, it seems like the whole world's quiet and no one's doing anything. So <laughs> that's just the nature of the beast, I guess. Um, guys, thank you so much for joining me today uh, and being here on UGA Sports Live. Uh, shout out to Dane and Trent. Uh, great stuff from you guys as always. I guess we'll have Fearless Leader back next week. So that'll be fun to get Roddy back and uh, see what he's missed. Um, but shout out to all of our sponsors as well. Academia Brewing, Classic City Eats on Baxter, Athens Ford, uh, Your Pie, Aaron Overhead Doors. Uh, just everybody that uh, takes care of us, go out and take care of them as well. We appreciate their support. We appreciate your support. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. And we will catch you again this time next week.